So you probably heard this text a million times before. Maybe this is the first time you've heard it. But uh, how many of you had uh, 1 Corinthians 13 at your wedding? Yeah. How many of you heard it at a funeral before? The service that I did last week, I chose this text because he was, people kept using the word loving about him, so I thought this text was perfect. So I'm going to invite us, um, I, I put the scripture text in, uh, in the bulletin because um, I know a lot of people like to write notes. Uh, some of us are visual, some of us know the Bible really well, and some of us don't. Um, so if you'd like to write notes, you'd just like to read along with me as I, uh, as I read this text, you're welcome to. So Paul was writing to a, a church uh, in conflict. So he, he wrote, and he was a beautiful writer. And he wrote, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, that's a lot of faith, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all of my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. So here it is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Right? And love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. Remember in those days, to be a child was not a beautiful thing. <laughs> when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly. In those days, mirrors were made of bronze. You can imagine how well you saw in a bronze mirror. So for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, and then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, you want to say this with me? And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. So if you would please pray with me to hear a good word from my words and from the meditations of your spirits and your hearts and minds. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of us, may they give you joy, O oh God. You who strengthen us day by day, and you who lead us and guide us day by day into new, abundant, and joyful life. Amen. So if you've ever read the Bible cover to cover, how many of you have done that in your lives? Oh, quite a few, actually. That's wonderful. Um, if you have done that, I was raised in, partially in evangelical, so we did that all the time. We just would start over, go to Genesis, Genesis to Revelation, then we'd start over like the next week. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we understood the deep truths of, this, of the Bible by doing that, but... Anyway, um, if you've ever done that, you may have discovered a fundamental truth about the Bible, which is that not all scripture was created equal. Some of the Bible is confusing, 
Some of it is stomach churning. Some of it is downright baffling. I will nominate Revelation for that prize. And some of it can just be a slog. It reminds me why I've never gotten into the Lord of the Rings books. How many of you were ever fans of those books or could even, you know, make it through the three-hour movies, <laughs> okay? I never could get through those because I don't really care who is the son of who. It's just not, it's just not, my, not my thing. And some of the Bible can feel like that, right? It can feel like that. But thanks be to God, thanks be to God, that most of the Bible is incredibly compelling. It really is. And occasionally some of the stories, the Psalms, the letters lift up off the page and take flight. And I would say to you that this is one of those texts. Amen? Now, I think I've read 1 Corinthians 13 at probably 80% of the weddings I've ever officiated. And it makes sense, right? Because it's about love. It's about love. Right? Or is it about love? Or both? Preachers tend to get kind of uh, touchy about this text. <laughs> Because technically, this isn't about love, about romantic love. Paul isn't writing to a church about, he's writing to a church not to a couple about to get married. But the truth is, whether it's about love or whether it's about love, I think Paul has something to say to us, to all of us who are in relationship, whether it's friendship or partners, co-workers, church, is that all of us right here. Yes, it is. So who we love is not what he addresses here. He cares how we love. Say that with me. He cares how we love. And he cares what love is made of, especially in a body of Christ in a church. Now, can you imagine if you were one of those who had heard these words from Paul? So how they did it was, you know, not everyone could, could read in those days, right? So someone who could read would, would read the letter out loud to the church, okay? That's how it worked. So someone was reading this letter out loud from Paul, and you know what? It's hard to imagine now, but they were probably angry about this letter. They were probably kind of ticked off when they heard these words from Paul. Now, can you believe that, that they were offended? Well, why would they be offended when this letter is about love? Why? Well, it's because Paul seemed to believe that the church in Corinth was chock full of gifted people who had all the gifts you could ever want, gifts of the Spirit, right? People could speak in tongues, could prophesy, had great knowledge of God, people of great spiritual gifts, but they only lacked one thing, and what was that thing? It was love. The King James Version, if you grew up with that, translate that translates the word uh, agape as charity, which is closer to the kind of love that we're talking about. This is agape love, which is self-sacrificing, self-giving, a charitable love, a love that is patient and kind, not envious or boastful. So you can have all the spiritual gifts you want, Paul was saying to that church in Corinth, and they did. They really believed they did. But if they're not offered in love, then they're useless. They're not worth one darn thing. They're as useless as a noisy gong. That's not such a fun or pleasant thing, is it? And they're as pointless as a broken symbol. Who wants a broken symbol? Say with me, not me. Now, Paul has this uh, amazing gift for soaring rhetoric, and that's why you can lift this text up out of its context and read it anywhere. You can you read it at a, a wedding on a beach, and it just works beautifully and perfectly. But you know what? I've been a pastor for, what, almost 10 years, and I've been part of quite a few church communities in my day, and I have observed, I don't want to quibble with Paul, but I'm going to, I've observed in all of those church communities that even in the ones that were having a lot of conflict, that there was still agape love present in all of them. Still in all of them, right? But even in the best churches, I will say, even in the best churches, I've seen Christian love be challenged by two dynamics. If you would please hold up your, your bunny ears. 
So in the best communities, churches can be challenged in their Christian love by two things. The first dynamic is what I will call, do you want to be right or do you want to be married? <laughs> do you want to be right or do you want to be married? Now, I'm, I'm not saying anything new here when I will uh, point out to you that churches can function like families. Amen? Amen? We call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. I've already heard it here that some of you have told me that this church is like your family, maybe even better than your family. <laughs> now, especially for those of us who will live away from our families or for whom family life is complicated or painful, finding a church that feels like home is such a blessing such a gift. But we should know this, we forget though, that family life, is it not, is where the rubber hits the road. Can I hear an amen? amen? So what do you really believe? You should not ask your pastor what you really believe. You should ask your spouse, right? Or better yet, your kids. They know if there's a difference between what you say and what you do, right? And when churches, and every church is in this position now, when churches are facing uncertain futures, when their resources aren't matching up with their dreams, it can be so easy to line up into camps, right? To get tribal, to get frustrated when things don't go our way, or to stop listening at all. Can I hear an amen? You know, I've done that myself. I've done that myself. Pastors are just as likely to do it as anyone else. In the last church that I served, um, I really believed that God was calling the church to, um, to move away from its building because the building was just sucking away a lot of time, energy, resources. It was just an old building. It was built in the 1870s. And so I was thinking and thinking and dreaming and dreaming. And I thought, well, how wonderful would it be to move away from this building and to, you know, go, to, go downtown a few blocks away. and we can, we can start a new ministry in one of the storefronts. I was so convinced that that was what God wanted us to do. So convinced. And do you know what the people that I served and served with thought? Yeah. They said, no, my friends. <laughs> they, said, they said a loud and resounding no, right? I heard that <laughs> loud and clear. I was heard by it. But you know what? I came around. I came around. Because I remembered that church is something that we do together. Church is something that we do together. And that when there are winners and losers in conflict in a church, everybody loses. If that's the game you're playing, everybody's going to lose. So do we want to be right or do we want to be church? Now the second dynamic is what I will call hearts on sleeves. We do so many things here with love and care and passion, from music to mission, from youth ministry to committee work, just this week, I received this beautiful bereavement bag that was prepared for me uh, by the Parish Life Committee. It contained Kleenex and hand lotion and bagged tea and a soothing candle. I even got sparkly pins for my hair. I don't know if there was a point being made, but I'll, I'll take them. <laughs> it was so personal. It was so personal. And there was a reminder that even though my mom passed away three months, there was a recognition there. I'm still grieving. I'm still grieving. That's okay. Churches can do that kind of love so very well. But we can't do everything. We can't be everything. And churches get really challenged. Churches get challenged when they risk being seen with their hearts on their sleeves. So many churches want to love without risk. But that is not the love of Jesus. Not the love of Jesus. So many churches don't want to offend a single person in or outside of its community. But again, is that following in the way of Jesus? It isn't. 
Part of this reason that I was drawn to this church, there are many reasons. But part of the reason was because of the rainbow flag. Because you know why? It was a heart that you were wearing on your sleeve. It was a heart that you were wearing on your sleeve. It's a risk that you took and that you still take. But it's a risk that's worth it. It's worth the love of God and the people who come here because of it, right? That rainbow was a sign to me that I could love you, that I could love you. And I want to see as we go forward more hearts on our sleeves. Amen. So if you've ever read the Bible cover to cover, you know that all scripture was not created equal. Some parts of it need to be left in the past, and some parts of it call us forward to more love. As soon as I'm done speaking these words, we'll pray, we'll share communion together. How is God calling you and me and us to more love, to more love? We'll discover that together, hearts together, and hearts on sleeves. Amen.